Hi, this is me, Geek, and I'm Dan. Welcome back to the workshop. We are in the middle of a big CNC re rebuild. Uh, I started out with an Ox, Oozenest Ox CNC. I've been upgrading all the parts. There have been a few videos in this series already covering the gantry plates, the X-axis carriage, the Z-axis. Um, today, I'm working on the final axis, the Y-axis motion up and down. I have some 10 by 100 aluminium kind of plate stock, some 63 by 50, I think this is, chunks of aluminium. I've also got some of the original plates, the gantry plates from the ooze nest to machine up to make the remaining brackets to get this thing mechanically completed. So uh, let's do it. Cue the music. Ta-da! Pretty good, huh? Look! All done! So, uh, yeah, a lot of those flat brackets were pretty straightforward. Obviously, just um, drill a bunch of holes in a pattern. This is a little bit more interesting, making up the block for the ball screw nut uh, kind of connector. Obviously, fly cutting to get myself square with the approved machinist copper wire there, just to hold uh, the inconsistencies on the non-machined surfaces at bay. Um, obviously, if you want to look professional machining, make sure you spill blue dye over all the surfaces so it looks cool when you uh, machine it off again. Here we go, edge finding. Now I decided to do this, I've uh, split the block into, I want to machine both in the same setup. Uh, and this is where DRO is amazing. So I could edge find off of one block in one coordinate system, SDM1. Um, and then I could move into SDM2 and edge find the second block. And actually I only edge find one edge because obviously the vice surfaces are essentially keeping the um, Y axis identical. But then I could basically just flip between these two coordinate systems for every operation. So, you know, spot drill in the in the chuck, do that on one, and then I can just flip to the um, coordinate system that I've set up for the other block, go across, and so on and so forth, back and forth with each operation, so I kind of minimize the tool changes. Obviously we're drilling all the way through. This aluminium wants to wrap around drill bits like nobody's business. God, I love that. And obviously, yeah, stepping up kind of in phases through as many big drill bits as I've got. 
and then shifting over to the boring head. Ah, I obviously decided to drill and tap the holes before I switched the chuck over to the boring head, which makes sense. Lots again. <laughs> Trying to minimize, but there's, you're still doing at least a drill and a tap change for every hole. Now over to the boring head, and this is where having the two corner systems really pays off because you're kind of incrementing the diameter out on the boring head each time and being able to just inch both of these holes up in step with each other rather than having to do it all the way up through one and then repeat the whole exercise on the other uh, was quite useful. Okay, so a lot of just getting it machined flat surfaces to dimension, drill a few holes. I made a few screw ups in there. Uh, at least one of the front brackets, I drilled the wrong kind of dimensions off of <laughs> the edges. I just read the, the numbers the wrong way around. Uh, fortunately, I had enough material that I just was able to flip it over and make the correct dimensions and just avoid the extra wrong holes. But anyway, so let's have a look if we, um, so front plate goes on here. Uh, this is, um, because we're using this 8020, it's quite useful for reference surfaces. I know that this needed to be exactly 80 high and where these uh, slots lie. Um, and then I could make sure that the mounting holes for this BF12 uh, bearing bracket come brought it flush with this top surface. This is so that I always have good known distances both up and out from kind of my reference positions. So this is a pretty simple piece and actually because we're going into these slots, we can um, loosen these nuts and adjust it forwards and backwards if necessary, um, which was useful for alignment. Then if we move back to the middle of the machine. So this was probably the trickiest component of this setup. Uh, just that it had the most kind of operations, obviously bore through the center to meet the uh, ball screw nut here. Uh, you can't see it from this side, but obviously there are uh, a pattern of holes drilled on a, basically a circular basis at, I think it's 19 mil off center, five mil tapped for mounting the, uh, the nut in. And then crosswise, we have some countersunk uh, six mil holes um, for mounting to this piece of plate. This was originally <laughs> the gantry plate on the uh, ox. Uh, I just cut chunks out to, to provide me this part. I iterated a bunch actually between having this be full width, uh, exactly what shape to be, but because of the front plate uh, and the rear plate, in order to keep the most uh, motion, you kind of don't have a lot of room for this. Maybe that was a design flaw. I could have packed this out further and stepped out to avoid that issue, but I think this will be strong enough. I put a radius on this internal corner just because uh, it's nice not to have those sharp internal corners, particularly if you're going to be putting stresses through it. Um, and now if we move on to the back, there we are, you'll do. Uh, same, same bracket pretty much as the front bracket, slightly different hole arrangement, um, but same principle. And obviously this has got four cross holes for the, uh, the main uh, bearing support. Then another cross bracket across the back here, a little bit hard to see from this angle. It attaches into the back edge of this rear structure, right? Obviously we have uh, another piece of, uh, in this case, 6020 going that way. So this plate bolts into that and just mounts the 47 mil, I think. Um, kind of square pattern holes for the NEMA 23 with the coupler. And of course, same again on the other side. So basically a lot of, a lot of making, I think like basically eight different plates. Um, some of them I could do in pairs. Some of them I just had to kind of duplicate the, all of the work. 
but we're there we're mechanically connected which means that now nothing moves unless you drive a, a motor to move it um, and i do have a quick setup that i've been using just to test each axis so this is just a manual pulse generator like on a on a dial that i can use to drive the axis like one at a time in this case i have it wired into both y-axis motors so i can just do that change direction speed it up so this is actually as fast as this signal generator will let anything go i can dial it back down uh, which is which is fine but um i suspect having done this test on all axes same basic deal the axis moves no problem which is great it's not like so bound or anything that doesn't work moves across its whole line all good but it is pretty slow at top speed now it's possible that when i plug this into the duet uh it's capable of just driving signals a lot faster i don't know what the kind of balance is going to be like but i've always kind of suspected that i was going to want to increase the size of the motors to allow for faster motion i mean essentially these are now direct driving uh the ball screws which you know is a certain amount of distance per revolution not a lot compared to previously you know the output was on a uh you know the belt driven so you kind of uprated the diameter of the spindle of the motor with the pulley and then you're dragging across uh, it's obviously a lot faster <laughs> but less precise and there was always going to be that trade-off so we'll see i think the next step next video i will wire up all of the motors as was to the duet but i do also in this box i haven't opened it yet i have the breakout board for the duet so that basically that means that I, you can take all of the pulse enable direction signals from the duet as the controller but push them into external drivers and then by having external drivers you can uprate the amount of power each one of those can cope with so you can uprate the motors uh, which is another whole set of expense and upgrades which i sort of knew i was going to get to but I will do it first without that because I think it will be an interesting test just to see with essentially the kit that I had exactly before in terms of electronics and motors how it performs and then I'll have a baseline to compare to when I upgrade to bigger and better things. Um, now obviously I do need to do a few other bits and bobs that uh, I'll probably just do in the meantime. I need to set up the cable chain for all of the wires and uh, the tubing for the water cooled spindle needs to be run uh, i'm probably going to cover the ball screw rails um, with just like an l-shaped piece of maybe plywood or something so the cable chain can run on top of that and it will also provide a little bit of protection from dust and detritus getting into the ball screws so that sort of stuff needs doing but next video will be a real test of it actually doing cnc things um, so hopefully check back for that in a little while. Until then, thanks for watching. See you next time.